Good morning. And uh, thank you to David and Robin for inviting me to share some thoughts with you on my experience doing some resiliency work. My name is Suzanne Barclay. I'm the Executive Director of Cornell Cooperative Extension of Rockland County. But before that, most of my career was spent in government uh, at the municipal, county, and state level working as a planner. So most recently, I was with, I was with the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery. Uh, I started there in 2014. So I wanted to share some uh, challenging projects I worked on and some lessons learned. Uh, I will tell you, I have no answers, uh, but I think I do have some interesting questions for your consideration. So I want to talk about three projects I worked on. Uh, I was with the community reconstruction part of the agency, actually not in housing, but somehow housing always crept into the mix. So I want to talk about Squires Gate neighborhood in the village of Suffern. Uh, so th these, uh, this is in Rockland County. Suffern is a village of uh, moderate um, means. Um, and this is a neighborhood made up of duplexes along the Mawa River. I also want to touch upon a mobile home park on the other side of the county on the Hudson in the town of Stony Point. And finally, something completely different, we'll move to Westchester to the uh, very wealthy city of Rye uh, to talk about flooding there. So this is a duplex in the village of Suffern. It's in what is called the Squires Gate neighborhood. And you can see this is attached housing. These are side-by-side -side units. And you can see the party wall down the center of the building. So Squires Gate was a neighborhood built all at once in the 60s, uh, not only along the banks of the Mawa, actually in the floodway of the Mawa. And since that time, those residents have withstood repeated flooding. And in fact, one of the things that was most remarkable when I started working with the village in 2014 was people's feeling just overwhelmed and sick and tired of being flooded. So 2011, we had Hurricane Irene. It came through the neighborhood. Uh, it knocked two buildings off their foundations and some residents had eight feet of water in their homes. Uh, this is uh, Squires Gate is a dense neighborhood. It's well established. There are still some people who were there when it was originally built, as well as newer residents. So the issues here were three, uh, and we'll come back to these. Um, first of all, not everyone flooded. That's important to remember. Uh, this is attached housing. And finally, this is a village that was in fiscal distress. So in 2014, the village of Suffern made the New York State Comptroller's list of most fiscally distressed village in New York State. So what was the solution? Uh, we determined early on that elevation of these homes was not uh, a possibility. So initially, there was a, a buyout that was offered to the village by FEMA through the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. So the village uh, took the lead, and they were able to buy those two units I told you about before that were knocked off their foundations. They were structurally unsound, so they had to be raised. But after that, the village, uh, it's a small village. They don't have a lot of staff. As I told you, they're fiscally distressed. They were not keen on this program. Um, it was a burden to them. They didn't feel like they had the expertise, but also they did not want to lose the property tax revenue. Understandable, I think. So then there was a second uh, buyout initiated through the governor's office of storm recovery. So this is the way it works. Uh, a homeowner is offered a pre-storm fair market value. So that's a pretty good deal. Then uh, once the home is purchased, uh, it's demolished. Uh, the property is returned to its natural state, which uh, in this neighborhood is just grass. Uh, the village, in this case, takes uh, ownership of the property through a deed, and they covenant to um, make sure that that property is never developed in the future. They also have to maintain the green space in perpetuity. So what are the results? Uh, it's an ongoing process. Uh, I think there were some positive aspects. Uh, there is some um, increase in flood storage now in this neighborhood with some buildings gone. 
However, there's also a decrease in property taxes that the village has to deal with. There's a change in neighborhood pattern. Uh, but also there's an issue that uh, there was a, a dispute between neighbors because you had duplexes uh, where one owner had withstood flooding <clears throat> maybe multiple times, but you also had people who had bought into the neighborhood after Irene. So they were never flooded. They didn't want to, they didn't want to buy out, they just bought in. They were very happy where they were. So if their neighbor had withstood, you know, flooding over the years, you know, they felt it was, you know, not their problem. So, so that was an issue. There's, there's no good solution to this. It's just, you know, one of the problems that you face in doing this kind of work. So is it a good outcome? Well, I, I think you can argue it is. Uh, the people who were bought out uh, are hopefully in uh, a safer um, living situation. So that's a good thing. And in terms of impact on property values, I really couldn't say um, what, what that will do. I, I can't imagine it's positive, but that remains to be seen. So my next uh, story is about the mobile home park called Baymar, which is on the shore of the Hudson River in the town of Stony Point <coughs> in northern Rockland. So um, this uh, park, as you can see, is right on the river. It has beautiful views of the Hudson. I can understand why people would want to live there. So uh, in 2012, we had Superstorm Sandy came and inundated the entire park. So this is, actually I think there were over 120 mobile homes originally. And this site is such that it starts essentially at the level of the river and then it rises gently to the west up to train tracks. So that means that there are some homes that are at higher elevation than others. So Superstorm caused coastal flooding, homes were inundated, people were marooned in their homes, they had to be rescued by boat. But again, not everyone flooded. <clears throat> this is a very um, dense neighborhood. Again, there are people who've been here for decades, as well as a newer population. But it's, well, it's a well-established neighborhood and it, it is a community. People love living there. So you do have a large immigrant population, Spanish speaking, um, who tend to be the newer residents. Now one thing you should know about a um, mobile home park, which I had no clue about, is that uh, uh, first of all, mobile home parks in this country have largely been bought up by national corporations for investment purposes. Um, so they're another actor in this story. <coughs> Also, mobile homes are not real property. They're considered personal property. So you can't get a mortgage to purchase a mobile home. You can get a personal loan, but not a mortgage. <clears throat> so that's attractive to people who frankly, perhaps don't have a, a great credit history or simply don't have the money for a conventional stick-built house. As I mentioned, or I might have mentioned, these residents were range from very low income to moderate income but they all had a desire to stay in Rockland. They did not want to leave the town of Stony Point. They really didn't want to leave their school district. <clears throat> Another factor uh, we had to think about was that there's very limited availability uh, to locate a new mobile home. Towns don't want them. Some towns have virtually no room for mobile home parks, no zoning for mobile home parks. So it's very hard uh, to find new locations for them. <clears throat> so it turns out there wasn't one solution, there were multiple. Initially, we looked at um, ways to allow people to stay on the property. That wasn't possible. We tried a seawall that was simply infeasible. Um, and we also looked at elevating mobile homes. You can't do that with most of these homes. They were either too old uh, they were not structurally sound. You would have had to raise these mobile homes 10 feet in the air. It wasn't doable on this very dense site. So we did come up with a number of options. Uh, oh, I, I also should mention we had renters as well as owners on the site. So you have the mobile home park owner, you also have owners of their own mobile homes, and you have renters. 
So you have sort of three parties you're working with. For our purposes, we could only offer homeowners a home. We could not enter, uh, we could not offer renters home ownership. So what were the options? These were the options that have actually been employed. So we moved some residents to a new manufactured home elsewhere, off-site. They were very happy. Relocated a few mo existing mobile homes elsewhere. So there were some mobile homes that were not damaged and could be moved. So when possible, we did that. Uh, we also moved some families from their mobile home into conventional housing if they had uh, the credit uh, that could support that. And then finally, for those people who were renters, uh, we offered them rental assistance. And then again, there were people who don't want to move. Because I mentioned, there were some homes located at a higher elevation, they didn't flood. So they're saying, you know, why do I have to move? I've been here for decades, I'm fine. I don't want to be relocated. That's still, I think, in process. <laughs> But right now, they're still there. So that's the story of Baymar. And then finally, we have the city of Rye, which is located in southern Westchester on the Long Island Sound. If you're not familiar with it, it's a beautiful little city. It's an older city, well-established, with beautiful homes and a lovely downtown area. So um, through the, uh, however, through the city of Rye runs a normally beautiful little river called the Blind Brook. It's about as, you know, uh, attractive as can be for a, a, a small river. And it starts in the northwest, and it winds its way right through the middle of downtown, and then it makes its way out to the Long Island Sound. However, approaching the downtown area, the river is channelized. So Irene, uh, actually there was a storm in 2007, uh, that caused massive flooding uh, in the downtown area. So this is a picture of the YMCA. This is their front desk with about four feet of water in it. Um, in, this is uh, Hurricane Irene, uh, and this is the fire station downtown. And this is a little map. I don't know how much you can see, but the purple area, the light purple, shows the Blind Brook watershed. And if you can see a blue line that goes sort of from left down to the city of Rye, that is the Blind Brook River, the mighty Blind Brook. Now, the thing that you should know about this uh, watershed is that it's fully developed. The whole, you know, all of southern Westchester is fully developed. So it's not like uh, there's a lot of new areas that you can go for flood storage. So what did we do? We, we looked at the watershed first, um, and we analyzed any number of infrastructure solutions because this was an infrastructure program. So we looked at re-engineering uh, a sluice gate that was on a dam uh, north of the city. We looked at enlarging a pond that was upstream uh, north of the city to see if it might capture more runoff. We looked at developing new detention basins at Westchester County Airport. That becomes a wildlife, um, or attractive to wildlife, and that's a nuisance, and that was not allowed. So we looked at any number of um, engineering solutions, but none of them, either individually or taken together, would have made a sig significant enough impact uh, to uh, warrant doing them, spending the money, but they would also not have uh, uh, really addressed the flooding problem. Oh, we, um, right. So then, um, what was the solution in the city of Rye? Well, it's really, the only thing that uh, we came up with, the solutions were that people could harden their buildings. They could raise utilities, they could, um, do waterproofing, uh, the uh, YMCA, for example, installed floodgates. Um, but generally that was it, or you could elevate buildings. And in fact, some homeowners had elevated buildings. It's a very expensive proposition, um, and it takes you know six to eight months uh, for these larger homes to be elevated, so not an easy solution. So what are the learnings? 
uh, simply one size solution doesn't fit all, just doesn't answer everybody's needs. Um, not everybody wants to move, even though I see it as a, a, you know, a resident living in a very vulnerable situation, they don't necessarily see it like that or they're willing to take the risk. Um, you have to have buy-in from people, you have to keep them informed, and you have to educate them along the way, what you're doing, why you're doing, and uh, help them understand um, the, the kind of uh, work, uh, the resiliency parameters. And then finally, sometimes it's not a question of money. Um, sometimes you just have to learn to live with it. So those are my learnings. Thank you very much.